Wisdom. Used 234 times in 222 verses of the Bible. The skill of understanding the reality of the world and the spirits that drive it. The vision of the future of planet Earth is both tumultuous and peaceful. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Corey. And this is the weekend edition on Quick Study exclusively on the website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Great to have you with us today as we focus on Zechariah chapter 6 and 7. We are looking at the future rule, the vision of the rule of the future. And I think it's going to be very interesting. It looks nothing like all of the predictions from Nostradamus or Edgar Casey or any of the others, we'll talk about it coming up. Ryan is also here with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? Today, we're talking with a good friend of ours. He's a ufologist whose book was a bestseller on Amazon. I hope you join me for that. A ufologist studies UFOs. Bible archaeology, what's up? <laughs> Today, we are taking a look at some biblical prophecies that were fulfilled during the time period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we're also looking at God as the rescuer. We are studying the Bible cover to cover. Stay with us as we continue. Zechariah was writing during the time period when the Judean exiles had already been released from Persia and they were being established again back in Jerusalem. But by this time period, there were already prophecies about the next empire that was to come. Daniel lived in a very interesting time for Israel, a time of exile. Taken as a prisoner and indoctrinated into the ways of Babylon, Daniel lived to experience the fall of the Babylonian Empire. And yet, his position of political prestige survived into the time of the conquering Persian Empire. Close to the kings as a useful wise man, Daniel's position with God and man benefited a wide range of people. In the book called after his own name, Daniel recorded a series of visions that had to do with the Middle East's political future. Written sometime during the 530s BC, Daniel chapters 10 through 12 record predictive prophecies of kingdoms and rulers that would come hundreds and thousands of years later. Looking back at to what us is now history, we can see the words of Daniel's visions coming to pass. One of the most startlingly detailed prophecies of Daniel would be fulfilled in the man history has deemed Alexander the Great. Daniel chapter 11 records how three more kings of Persia would rise after the one Daniel knows, but the fourth would come against the nation of Greece, and this rise was not prophesied to end well. Then a warrior king will arise. He will rule a vast realm and do whatever he wants. But as soon as he is established, his kingdom will be broken up and divided to the four winds of heaven, but not to his descendants. His kingdom will be uprooted and will go to others besides them. This prophecy would find fulfillment a few hundred years after Daniel in the ferocious conquest of Alexander. Within a handful of years, this Macedonian prince forced Greece into an alliance and took and expanded the empire that had once been Persia. Yet, as Daniel foretold, Alexander died suddenly. Rulership passed to his generals, a kingdom broken, divided. Daniel 11 continues to prophesy about these generals, reading eerily like a newspaper.
It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible, and they are all around us. Today, our reading assignment, Zechariah 6 to 7. We're focusing on chapter 6. Now, wise guys know that we live in unique times. There are at least three reasons. First, we live in a time in which mankind has the ability locked into human arsenals to blow up the entire planet at least 17 times over. Every weapon that man has ever created, he has used upon himself. Now, the second reason is Israel is a nation. This is the first time since Messiah walked the earth that Israel has been a codified nation. The third reason is the global social and spiritual climate change and it's turning quickly. The earth superstorms reveal that what is underneath the four dimensions, there is a storm, that would be the spiritual dimension. And Zechariah gives a vision in chapter six of what is to come after all of this. Let's explore. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot black horses, with the third chariot white horses, and with the fourth chariot dappled horses, strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going to the north country, the white are going after them, and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out, eager to go, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, Go, walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me, saying, See, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives, from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedidiah, who have come from Babylon, and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold, make an elaborate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall go between them both. Now the elaborate crown shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord, for Helam, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, the sons of Zephaniah. Even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Zechariah chapter 6 verses 1 through 15. We are reading Zechariah. My name is Rod Hembry. You are watching Quick Study as we go through the Bible in one year and we're looking at the future. Now this is very, very important and I want to get right into it and focus on what the future looks like, not according to all of the science fiction folks, but according to the Bible. There's one thing in common with the future, and that is the subject of it, or the ruler of it, future rule. Here is Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1. Listen to the great prophet as he says, Then I turned and raised my eyes, and looked, and behold, four chariots coming from between the two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. Now with the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot were black, 
And with the third chariot were white horses, and with the fourth chariot were dappled horses, strong steeds. And then I answered and I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord, my master? And the angel answered me and said to me, These are the four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of the, all the earth. The one who is the black horse is going to the north country, and the white are going after them. The dappled are going towards the south country. Now, then the strong steeds, they went out eager to go, and that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, go walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me saying, see, those who go towards the north country have given rest to my spirit, capital S, in the north country. Now, before we go to the point, there is a very interesting heavy metal group called Megadeth. And the leader of that group, Dave Mustaine, has written a song called Holy War. And he talks about the coming war in which Jesus Christ himself destroys evil. I find that fascinating. So our point is this. The vision of future rule is powered by the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ, the conquering of sin. Now listen, sin will not rule, Christ will. Right now, beloved, in this world, sin rules. That's why we spend so much money on crime and all of that. I was talking recently to a viewer of Quick Study who was an undercover police officer, and we were talking about all of the money spent on trying to control the rule of sin. Very, very interesting. We must get on to verse 9. Here is the scripture. Zechariah says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives, from Heldiah, Tobijah, and Jedediah, who have come from Babylon, and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, take the silver and the gold and make an elaborate crown and set it on his head, the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak. He is, of course, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, that is Jesus Christ, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now, here is the next point, which I think is fascinating and important. He shall bear, that, uh, he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So, listen now, he shall be the priest on his throne, and the council of peace bet shall be between the both. Now, here's the point I wanted to get to. The vision of the future rule is that through Jesus Christ only, peace will rule the economies of the world, not war. You see, we live in history, a time in history, when throughout history it's been nothing but the rule of war. War is used to gain to the next uh, kingdom what it can. But in the future, Jesus Christ is going to rule with peace. He's not going to rule with war. He's going to conquer with war, reset the world, and rule with peace for a thousand years. Fascinating. Look at verse 14 of chapter 6 of uh, Zechariah. It's fascinating. Now the elaborate crown shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord for Helam and Tabajah and uh, Jedediah and the son of Zephaniah, and the son of Zephaniah. Even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall, be, this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. I'm moving quickly because we're running out of time. But here's the next point. The vision of future rule is that obedience to God's holy purposes will be deeply desired rather than the love of selfish lust. In other words, people will want to. People will want to worship Christ. People will freely bring gifts. Notice here that the gold and the silver is coming from Babylon, coming from the city of evil, the city of rebellion that Nimrod built. This is absolutely a different picture that we see of the future than many of the science fiction writers would like us to imagine. And so in the future, beloved, let me be very clear to say that actually Dave Mustaine and Megadeth are correct. There is a holy war coming. 
and that holy war, Jesus Christ, Revelation 19 for the details, Yeshua HaMashiach will conquer sin and will manage with peace. And what a day of Messiah that will be for a thousand years. The teaching material on today's program is in print form in our Bible guide. Write for yours today. The address is coming up later. Right now, you and I are going to explore a theme, an attribute of God that becomes a theme within the entire Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, this particular theme often gets lost uh, in people's thinking of the Old Testament. Within the content of the first two books of the Bible, revealing information on the character of God is given. The personality of God established in the beginning is important. It should act as the reader's foundational point of understanding. Whatever he or she learns about God from the rest of recorded history should be anchored by the first descriptions of God's personality. In the creation account, God is shown as creative truth that is, that exists and cannot be resisted successfully. Many attributes of God are built upon this foundation of living truth. But there is one that is the star of Genesis and Exodus, God as a rescuer. More than once, God is seen to initiate salvage operations for mankind. In Genesis chapters 6 through 9, we learn of the flood of Noah. This history is often used to give God a bad reputation as a judgmental tyrant. But the careful reader will notice instead a different emphasis. Mankind is recorded as morally ruined, enacting terribly strange corruption regularly except for one family, that of Noah, whom God rescues from the corruption of humanity and from the judgment of that corruption, the flood. Genesis chapters 18 and 19 record another famous saving act that again is often used to blacklist God, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. In this history, we have God setting up Abraham to negotiate for the survival of the cities. When Abraham's mercy has run out, God still sends angels to one of the cities. When they still cannot meet Abraham's criteria for survival, the family of Lot is still saved. A third famous rescue of the righteous is seen in the event of the Exodus. God hears and sees the enslavement of the descendants of Abraham, and through a long, miraculous process, he saves and purifies them. One of the early established characteristics of God is his desire to save. Who is Satan? Where did he come from? What does the Bible say about this fallen angel? Why does the Bible say there is no such thing as a balance between good and evil, but that God is all powerful and that evil has power because Christians do not recognize the authority they have in Christ? These two provocative presentations on a special DVD are from Bible Discovery Seminary a never-seen-before DVD designed to help the believer understand the truth about spiritual warfare. For your DVD containing the dangerous casual Christian and who is Satan, you can write to us for a gift of $25 or more. We'd be happy to send it to you. Write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or in Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Rod Henry here along with Corey on the weekend edition of Quick Study as we go through the Bible cover to cover. A part of studying God is studying the stars. Here to help us find out more is Rye the Science Guy with Cosmic Mysteries. Today we're talking with a good friend of ours. He's the CEO of Creation Ministries International USA and a ufologist. What's a ufologist? Well, it's someone who studies the UFO phenomenon. Now I'd like to introduce you to this man. His name is Gary Bates. <laughs> My name is Gary Bates. I'm the CEO of Creation Ministries International in the United States. Uh, I don't sound like an American because that's uh, because I'm Australian. 
Uh, I've been involved in the creation evolution uh, issue um, for around about 22 years now. Started off as a volunteer uh, due to my interest in the subject and, uh, and ended up becoming full-time working for the ministry as a speaker and a writer. Uh, one of my, uh, my niche area for the ministry is in the subject matter of UFOs, aliens, extraterrestrial life or whether such things actually exist. As a young man growing up, I, I did a lot of my secondary education in the United Kingdom and as a, a, as a young man, uh, I was taught to believe in God. In those days, uh, not so long ago, in case people are wondering, but we sang hymns and said prayers and morning assemblies at school. And uh, so, the, the, if you like, the idea of a, a Christian God still permeated throughout the culture. Uh, we were given Bibles at school by the Gideons and, and nice things like that. But I noticed an inconsistency that we would worship this God and we would be taught to believe in the Bible. And then I would go across to my biology classes and I was taught, you know, basically we'd evolved from apes, that the earth was millions or even billions of years old. And uh, of course there was a disparity there. So I remember very, very early on in my teenage years wrestling with the question of whether there was a God or not. So I would probably describe myself best as an agnostic for many years. And uh, as I uh, got married, became a father, uh, I used to look at my little children, wondering what sort of world we'd brought them into, believing it was dog eat dog, survival of the fittest. And I started to realize that in fact, the idea that there was a God was becoming more and more distant to me. And so being a science junkie, uh, I believed that the science of the world was really authoritative and ultimately came to the conclusion that the Bible was wrong. So there was a point in my time I declared there was no God. And it wasn't actually long after that I had an about face and changed my mind 180 degrees uh, on the subject, uh, purely from sitting down and actually reading the Bible and what it said. And even though I still hadn't reconciled the scientific issues, reading the words of Jesus and understanding the personhood of Jesus himself and what he did on the cross, I realized that he wasn't a, a good guy taken out of context as I thought for many years, that uh, he had some prescient knowledge about what he was doing, that he'd completed his task. And so once I realized uh, or came to accept the words of Jesus that he, he, he was who he said he was, uh, I became a Christian. But then I still had to reconcile this idea of evolution and the incompatibility of scripture. And so that set me on a journey. I uh, got introduced to creation information simply because I heard of a lecture being advertised on a local Christian radio station. And I went along and crowded into a room with about 700 other people. Uh, one of the, still probably one of the largest meetings we've ever had in that city. And uh, I just always have to know, I'm not the shy retiring type, so I put my hand up amongst all those people and asked questions about evolution and the Bible. And he was able to give me answers. <laughs> Now we'll continue talking to Gary next weekend, and I'm gonna ask him why he believes the doctrine of creation is so important to the Christian. In the meantime, if you'd like a copy of his book, Alien Intrusion, you can find it online at creation.com. It is a great book, and that is a great website. Remember, here at Quick Study, we are taking you through the Bible in one year. We're available on the iPad, on the Android, on the Note 2, on the S4, on pretty much any kind of droid you want. Okay. Uh, we're available, let's see, on computers. We're available on the Roku box. We're available on Google TV. We're available on, well, whatever other TVs you have out there. Very interesting stuff. And also the teaching of the program is available on the Quick Study Pocket Guide. On the screen, you'll see we have uh, the inside part of the pocket guide, one page for each day, unique commentary. This pocket guide is given to those who give to the ministry monthly on a regular basis. If you'd like to do so, we sure could use your help. Hey, listen, here's our address in the United States of America, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. You can call at 724-733-8336. Now, if you live in Canada or any other part of the world, then write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. And our area code there is 519-940-8338. Remember, you can reach us also if you want to listen on shortwave at 9.330 megahertz. And remember our Bible Mythbusters question on the website. 
Do you think the Bible or the books of the Bible were chosen by the church? BibleDiscoveryTV.com for the poll. Then we'll show you and take you to the new Bible Mythbusters blog in which uh, I actually put together a little bit of a thread of history about how we got the Bible and much more. Check us out at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. in which we live now is so far out of sync to the way our Creator intended it to be, it's just devastating. Sin has left deep wounds on the planet in the spirit of men and women, in the atmosphere both spiritual and physical, and those wounds have distorted our vision of God's original creation. But hope has its reasons. God's wisdom is at work in us when we understand that all of creation will change in the future. Everything we know will be reformed by God's power and His plan for the future of peace. Although hard to understand now, our eternal hope is in God's future plans for peace, not our own personal pleasure now. With that we pray, Lord, help me to think bigger and beyond myself. I want to see your future rule in my life. As we go through the Bible, we also study the book of Proverbs, and today we're studying Proverbs chapter 20, verse 15. There is a gold, or there is gold and multitudes of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are precious jewels. What an amazing statement. That statement says to us, oh, there's substance that are things that are valuable that people want and will pay for. But the most valuable thing in the world is wisdom from the mind and from the lips of somebody who has that wisdom. You know, the Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. Why? Simple. Because when you recognize that you yourself are not God, you yourself are not a God, but you need the help of your Creator who gives you the very breath in you, you become wise. You begin to treat others as if they too are created by God. Do you want to become wise today? One of the wisest things you'll ever do is recognize the power of Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross and rose again that we might be freed from the bondage of sin and have the gift of eternal life. Come to Jesus today and pray and say, Lord, I believe you're my savior. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. I take you now. Thank you for joining us today, radio listeners. Our address is P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2.